Good day and welcome to this lecture entitled Paano na sila? Fighting COVID-19 and Food Insecurity. We are from CW3 Laboratory. CW3 stands for Community Welfare, Wellness, and Wellbeing. We are a group of researchers from various departments and programs of Ateneo de Manila University as well as UP Los Baños College of Human Ecology. We have research projects about feeding program, health, and nutrition. And from these researches, we are able to get some data and information, which we think might be relevant to share to the community, given the current situation that we are in. Just a disclaimer, if there are any reference to any specific product or entity, it does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by CWT. The views and opinions expressed by CW3 employees are those of the employees and do not necessarily reflect the view of CW3 or any of the mentioned entities. We would like to begin our discussion by showing you some video clips as an introduction of the topic that we will be discussing. Just like millions of people across the country, the Feliciano family have been asked to stay indoors and to practice social distancing. But that is nearly impossible, for this is the place they call home, a 12 square meter house for nine members of their family. The Felicianos say they are fine with their living conditions. It's the lack of ability to make a living they are worried about. I have a baby and she needs milk and diapers. We can't work. How will we be able to eat? I'm also worried of our family getting sick. We can't afford to be hospitalized. Kwento ng mga lalaking ito, 500 piso pataas kada araw ang kita nila dati sa pagbebenta ng sorbetes at tumataas pa tuwing mainit ang panahon. Ang makukulay na lagayan ng sorbetes itinago na muna sa bodega. Sa ngayon, hindi alam kung kailan muling maririnig ang kalembang ni Mamang Sorbetero sa trabaho market. Hindi na kami papasok sa ibang barangay. Ay, hindi na kami pwedeng maging lang. Sa tigil na muna kayo. Sabi ng ilang chopper, napilitan silang bumiyahe dahil wala silang pangkain sa araw-araw. Nagugutom talaga kami pag hindi kami bumiyahe dahil wala kami pira, wala kami pambili ng bigas. Mahirap eh. Mahirap pag mahirap. Walang pagkukunan ng kailangan pagkain. Sina Tatay Rinaldo, Tatay Danilo, at Nanay Joy ay ilan lang sa mga kababayan nating lubos na nahihirapan at nababahala kung paano nila bubuhay ng kanilang pamilya sa gitna ng kawalan ng trabaho dulot ng enhanced community quarantine. The ECQ is viewed as a measure to stop the transmission and spread of COVID-19. While it is necessary, as manifested in the videos, the said measure has serious consequences, especially for those in the most vulnerable groups. To provide another picture or an idea of the extent of ECQ's impact, we consider a household survey conducted by CW3 uh, from more than 300 households with a public school student in a highly urbanized city in Metro Manila, 64% or more than half of the households have at least one member who's a daily wage earner. Or higit sa kalahati ng mga sambahayan ay may manggagawang kagaya ni Tatay Reynaldo, mga manggagawang factory worker, construction worker, service crew, at iba pang katulad. Meanwhile, 38% of the households have at least one member engage in elementary occupation or from the informal sector, like Tatay Danilo or other street vendors or food vendors. In the same survey, 63% are considered food insecure. What does this mean? Food insecurity is the lack of reliable access to, to sufficient, affordable, and nutritious food. Kung baga, mapamilyang pong ito ay maring hindi nakakakain ng masustansyang pagkain o hindi man lang nakakakain ng tatlong beses sa isang araw. The issue of food insecurity will be further discussed later on, but at this point, what we want to highlight is, even in normal times, food insecurity is a persistent challenge that the community, that the country faces. And during ECQ, 
we expect this number to only get higher or the situation to get worse. The government has announced various support programs for the families, but they are currently working on some operational and implementation matters. Meanwhile, the Filipino spirit is well alive with various part, uh, private organizations or individuals rallying support for these families. Amid this background, this lecture wishes to be a reminder not only to address the hunger of the vulnerable families, but also let's ask how can we modify our efforts to ensure that these families also receive the nutrients they need to stay healthy and fight other diseases. The rest of the discussion will go deeper on the income shock experienced by these vulnerable families and provide some suggestions on how can we better provide assistance to these families as they fight COVID-19 and food insecurity. Hi everyone, I'm here to talk about some of the terms mentioned earlier, as well as some of the observations that we made. In 2018, our team interviewed mothers in a survey of 300 plus households. Some of their responses were, pagpagain, pagkain talaga, priority yun. Lala mga anak ko, bata pa, kailangan nila yung mas maganda sila. Or, naapektohan ng pagbabudget. Dati, nakakapagmanok, ngayon, dalata na lang. So these households experience problems of accessibility to food or accessibility types of food. As many parents might agree with, some children can be difficult to feed, especially if it's something they don't want to eat. But the problem starts to become serious if it's because there aren't any alternatives, and not just because they're being picky eaters. Food insecurity is an inherent problem, especially in low-income households. In February 2018, 63% of our surveyed households experienced some level of food insecurity. 25% of these surveyed households experienced severe food insecurity. But what is severe food insecurity? Well, it's when the household either lacks resources to get food of any kind, or a household member goes to sleep hungry, or goes a whole day and night without eating any kind of food, because there wasn't enough food. Other questions we use to measure food insecurity include asking if they worry about not having enough food, or if they eat smaller portions, or eat fewer meals, or eat food they don't like because of the lack of resources. Depending on whether they answer yes or no to some of these questions, we then classify them to be mild, moderate, severe, or experiencing no food insecurity. Now these observations were made in early 2018, before the onset of high inflation. Uh, to give you some historical data, uh, in 2018, from the period of January to October 2018, we experienced high and increasing inflation rates, which also corresponds to high prices of consumer goods, which includes food. From now, from 63% of the households experiencing food insecurity, the proportion now rises to 76% in September 2018. Now, what does this mean with what's happening now during the ECQ period? Well, right now, daily wage earners and those engaged in types of informal work lose that source of their income. Evident from the data, High food prices for low-income households lead to food insecurity. But from already low income levels, decreased income will lead to deleterious effects. It's going to be much, much worse than just increasing the increase of food prices. To put things in perspective, 
uh, Director General of the National Economic and Development Authority, Ernesto Pernia, in June 2018, said that a family of five needs 42,000 pesos a month to live decently. Now, this translates to 2,100 pesos a week per person. Now, it was mentioned earlier that 63% of the surveyed households have at least one member engaged in uh, one daily wage earner. Okay? So, during the ECQ period, on average, the household loses... 2,638 pesos of their weekly, their usual weekly income. For these households, their best case, okay, best case is losing income that would have been enough to sustain a person for the week. Fourteen percent of the households have at least two daily wage earners. Their decrease in weekly income now doubles to five thousand two hundred seventy-six pesos. Considering now informal work, thirty-eight percent of the surveyed households have at least one person engaged in informal work, translating to a decrease in income of. 2,076 pesos. This income shock magnifies the problems in health and nutrition. The vulnerability of the elderly is highlighted in the media. But another vulnerable group we consider is children. Children who have a weakened immune response due to malnutrition. So, what do we do now? Hello. If what's been happening bothers you, perhaps the next question to ask is, what now? Although malnutrition has some truly deleterious effects on the health and well-being of Filipinos, there are some efforts that can help manage the effects of malnutrition, particularly for the vulnerable sectors, aside from boosting the funds of LGUs. And I'll be talking about some of them today. One thing we can do is prioritize rations for the vulnerable households. So as DJ and Le'an discussed, the poor are more vulnerable to food insecurity, in turn making them more vulnerable to malnutrition. As for children, almost 2 million malnourished children benefit from some form of government-sponsored school feeding program in the Philippines. However, nutrition plays a key component in immune response, both in the short and the long term. In the short term, nutrition is a key component of viral immunity or the ability to fight off a viral infection like COVID-19. And in the long term, malnutrition can lead to negative impacts that worsen one's susceptibility to disease. So what can LGUs do? We know that rations are limited, but LGUs can prioritize households with the elderly, children, and the sick because those are the ones who need to fight off a viral infection the most. They can do this by accessing a barangay registry, which has a list of the poorest of the poor households, and even data from public schools because they have a list of the students enrolled in the school feeding program. So when barangays or LGUs are able to target and prioritize the poorest of the poor and the neediest households, they can ensure that these families have adequate and healthy meals for their children. Another thing that can be done is to include healthy cooked meals in relief packages. So the standard relief package has rice, canned or processed meats, some form of drink like a coffee or a cereal energy drink, and it's for a family of five for two days. And these are very good at meeting caloric intake, which is how many calories you take in a day. However, these have very high sodium fat and cholesterol contents, especially in the processed and canned meats. But Nutrition isn't just about the amount of calories you take in. The micronutrients that make up the food are also very important. So with these processed foods, they put Filipinos at very high risk for cardiovascular diseases like stroke and hypertension. And in fact, ischemic heart disease is one of the leading causes of death and the top burden of disease in the Philippines. So in an ideal situation, we would like to have cooked vegetables or fresh foods in our relief packages, but this cannot always be done. 
so we can turn to fortified snacks or fortified food. Like the NFMC, which has fortified healthy snacks like the Remo Curls, Remo Blend, Micronutrient Growth Mix, Brown Rice Bar, or Iron Fortified Rice. Another NGO called NVC also has Mingo, which is a nutritious instant meal that's already been deployed in many disaster and emergency operations in the Philippines. For other LGUs, which already have the infrastructure of, say, a school feeding program, so they have school cafeteria operations or a centralized kitchen, they can borrow this infrastructure to also cook healthy meals because their volunteers are already very used to cooking large-scale meals and have them um, cook and pack these relief goods instead. And they'll be following very similar protocols to volunteers packing existing relief goods. So that's proper hygiene, social distancing, and they'll be able to help meet nutritional requirements for these households receiving their relief goods, as well as protecting community health. Another thing that can be done is to provide access to fresh meat and vegetables, and this goes hand in hand with increasing food production. So in the Philippines, more than half of all the households don't have a refrigerator, so they can't stock fresh ingredients on their own. But these fresh ingredients are crucial to providing essential vitamins, minerals, and micronutrients that I talked about earlier. So we know also that food availability and LGU capacity vary per locality. And right now, given the ECQ, uh, it's not only that low-income households cannot purchase fresh meat and vegetables, but there are limitations to mobility and accessing marketplaces. So what we might be able to do is first providing a stimulus for agriculture and food production to increase the supply of available food. And then these ingredients can be made part of the food rations for households. So we might be able to do this through government subsidy for private and public sector coordination among large-scale food producers and distributors to ensure that food supply is present for the entire year and that prevents not only the physical hunger but also a social unrest that can come with deprivation. Finally, I want to talk to you about strengthening our primary healthcare systems. So as we've seen on the news, the Philippine health system is currently overwhelmed by the growing number of COVID-19 cases. All of our health professionals and resources are mostly being devoted to efforts fighting COVID-19. And they're very important efforts because we need to track transmission, we need to test cases, and we need to treat patients. However, primary health care is more important than ever. And we need to do our part and cooperate to make sure that our health system is not overly stressed or overly burdened. So this means basic health system functions, like patients not flocking to hospitals and emergency rooms when they have a sickness, but going first to their primary healthcare provider. So for most people, this is their Barangay Health Center, this is the RHU, and this will prevent the strain that's already faced by emergency rooms continually accepting new COVID-19 patients or patients presenting with COVID-19 symptoms. Also, when ECQ ends, Things like vaccinations will be very helpful because they prevent a lot of diseases. And this is useful because when an epidemic like COVID-19 happens, it prevents the health system from being burdened with these preventable diseases and we can focus our resources on treating the epidemic. Also, private and public partnerships can expand the reach and services of the health sector for things like the production of medical equipment or the production of medical supplies, or even the manufacturing of essential medicines. So, what we need to remember in times like this is that food insecurity is a challenge, but it's only exacerbated by epidemics like the COVID-19. In regular times, food insecurity is already a challenge our country faces, and the current epidemic is just adding on to that, dealing a big blow to the society and our whole economy. But we have to keep the long term in mind. Because after the dust settles, what's most important is that every Filipino is healthy enough to return to school or to work and build our country up once again. And maybe after all of this negativity, it's important to ask what's good. To end on a more positive note, we want to share some good practices. These are concrete examples to show that the recommendations discussed by Van are actually not impossible to be implemented. For instance, in Valenzuela City, they have a central kitchen to cook for their frontline workers, 
They also have food vouchers, their care nutri packs, care package for PWDs, so that certain vulnerable groups will receive the nutrients they need during this time of crisis. Meanwhile, in Pasig City, uh, we might be familiar with their mobile palenque. It ensures access to healthy food, and at the same time, it also guarantees income for families engaged in selling of raw ingredients. Then for Bukawi Bulacan, instead of distributing canned goods, they distributed fresh vegetables for their elderlies. Uh, yes, during this time, it is more challenging to ensure food security, but with a little effort, a little more creativity, and cooperation between individuals and institutions, we can really make food security a reality. Speaking of cooperation, we would like to take this opportunity to invite local government units and private organizations for collaboration or knowledge sharing. The CW3, together with Ateneo Center for Educational Development and GK's Cusina Nakalina, has been working on a template for city and municipality-wide public school feeding program. Uh, we have been studying the idea of Central Kitchen, which I think is a very effective method to feed a large number of beneficiaries with greater efficiency. And so if there are any LGUs or private organizations listening right now, feel free to send us an email or message us to our Facebook page, and we will be happy to share the knowledge or insights we got from our site visits. Uh, if there are other organizations implementing mass feeding program, especially during the time of enhanced community quarantine, feel free to message us also and help us enrich our knowledge. During this time, we are faced with a big and complex problem. And different individuals, institutions, organizations must really work together and learn from each other so that we can better move forward. We also hope that we will continue to work for our vulnerable families. And with that note, we would like to end our discussion. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for your time. We look forward to your responses and we hope for everyone's safety and good health. Thank you.